Tonight, the Bridgegate scandal is not over yet. We are now hearing indictments could be handed down within a week, and I'll be talking to a top New Jersey political journalist who says Governor Christie is becoming more and more like this guy. Funny how? I mean, what's funny about it? <laughs> Tommy, no, you got it all wrong. Oh, 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 Anthony. He's a big boy. He knows what he said. What'd you say? Right. Funny how? Will I amuse you? Then Senator Robert Menendez still fighting, but for some reason, Republicans in D.C., they're staying eerily quiet about the corruption charges he's facing. What's going on here? And as we learn more about the deadly police shooting in South Carolina, we look at the ongoing rift between police and the communities. Is there any way that things can get better? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French, and we begin tonight in New Jersey. A lot is happening in the Garden State. Bridgegate indictments could be coming down any day now. We also have new information on Senator Robert Menendez and the Port Authority. They're also getting subpoenaed. A short time ago, I spoke to Alfred Doblin, the editorial page editor of The Record, about all that and more. All right, a lot to get to here. Let's start with uh, some of these pending indictments. Are you hearing the same thing as maybe as early as next week regarding Bridgegate? We could start to see some indictments. Well, you know, I, we've been hearing we've been hearing about that. You know, sort of like we hear about spring. So I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of buzz, but I don't I don't really know who who's talking to whom. I'm not plugged into the U.S. attorneys, so uh, Paul Fishman's not telling me what he's doing. Fair enough. Uh, it does seem the likelihood is if they do come down or when they do come down, they'd probably be under the umbrella of uh, the fraud statute, right? Because they're looking at more than just Bridgegate. Potentially, there could be everything here from, uh, you know, payoffs, bribery. Um, this could be more expansive than we originally thought. Well, I think that seems to be what a lot of folks have been, you know, speculating on is that while it started out as to what exactly happened um, back in September of 2013 on the bridge, um, you know, the record's done a lot of you know, very strong reporting yep. by, you know, Sean Boberg and other and other folks, um, you know, really looking at the role that former Port Authority Chairman David Sampson had um, in votes that he was taking as chairman um, that might have benefited clients from Wolf and Sampson, which is changing names to something I do not remember, um, but a very long new name for their mm -hmm. firm. Um, and I, and I, so I think a lot has morphed from the from just the bridge. But I think, no, make no mistake about it, I think there's a lot of questions we want answered as to um, what was the motivation for the lane closures, who actually, you know, decided in the planning stages of it, and then after it happened, when did the governor find out about it? So I think that's one component of it. Um, I think the the actual Port Authority has become this, you know, big can of worms that's opened up in terms of how it's been run, how it was run under Sampson, um, the, the way people were able to sort of function in there, uh, like David Wildstein and Bill Baroni, what kind of oversight. So it, it, it's, it's a multi-faceted uh, investigation. Well, to that end, um, to where that goes, we can also talk about questions arising out of the Exxon settlement. You wrote a piece recently where you compared the governor to Joe Pesci, where you don't know when he's going to snap, but you know um, one little thing could trigger it right now. Before we get into the poll numbers, the governor himself, um, he seemed to be Teflon not long ago, but stuff isn't just bouncing off him. It's sticking to him, whether it's the investigations or the perception here that he's not that much different than other people that used to be in Trenton before. Uh, the rules seem fungible. Well, you know, I'll say this as someone old enough, you know, Teflon, Teflon chips away. You know, uh, you know. Look at a fry, look at a really old fry pan that's covered in Teflon. It ain't pretty. So I think what we're seeing is 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 the longevity of you know he's been now in office for a while, and and there's certain things that are just kind of old. You know, the the uh, the bullying style is getting somewhat old. Um, the the minute you start pushing, you know, pulling away at the veneer of stuff, you start questioning things. So the Exxon, se you know, settlement, you know, it may may have been the best deal the state can get. Um, there's a lot of speculation about really whether it was or it wasn't, and that the settlement happened at, at, at its particular timing, um, whether the settlement was really a way of getting um, 
quite a lot of money that can go to balance the state budget because th there's only like the first 50 million is going to uh, be used for, has to be used for remediation. Uh, so I, th I, th I think the act is no longer new, the Teflon is no longer new, and uh, what, what we're seeing is, is people now are pushing back on all levels. You know, the poll that came out uh, recently, the, the Rutgers poll that shows that he's got a 41% approval rating with 58% in the negative. Significant, in fact, because this Alfred came after he tried the charm offensive with these town halls that have worked for him in the past, not working now. Uh, is it just fatigue because people have seen this act before? Or is it something more that the governor's got a real problem with here? You know, one is he's just not in New Jersey. You know, I mean, you know, whether he wants to say he's running for president or not, I mean, he's traveling every week. He's out of state somewhere. Um, people see that, you know, and they, they see that a lot of issues within the state have not been resolved. So they sort of say, well, what are, what are we getting for our money's worth out of this guy? You know, the speeches, we've heard the speech. These town halls are designed to have a particular effect, but they're the exact same script. The, the state is not doing well, and there's, there's genuine frustration and it's not partisan frustration. These are not Democrats, these are not Republicans, these are not independents, these are New Jerseyans. Um, so I think you're starting to see a, you know, people coalescing in, in that sense that we're not happy with what this guy is doing. Finally, the other big name, obviously, in the news in Jersey politics, Senator Menendez. Interesting that Senate Republicans um, have largely given him a pass to this point on this. And moreover, speaking of polls in New Jersey, you know, 58 percent of New Jerseyans say as, as long as this is what's out there, let him keep his job and continue serving as senator. I, I know this is going to play out in the courts, Alfred, but have you been a little surprised there hasn't been more blowback than we've seen to this point? Well, not from the Republican side. You have you know, have to consider that Menendez is is probably the most powerful Democrat who is criticizing Obama's uh, you know uh, deal with Iran, um, with opening up Cuba. So, from a Republican standpoint, you know they actually kind of like that Menendez is is creating some of the um, the pushback they want to see in in Congress. Uh, I think in terms of the Jersey public, you know. It's fickle. I mean, I think it could change in terms of the way people react about the Menendez indictments. Right now, it's going it's to quiet down until, you know, we move forward again in the courts. It's a complicated case. It's not as if someone has said he, you know, someone gave him an envelope with cash and he took it. Um, it's getting into the sort of gray area of, of money to uh, political action committees, um, whether he used, whether there's a direct tie, quid pro quo, for those, for those donations and what he did and advocated for. Um, it's gray. And I think a lot of people view good or bad, because of Congress's approval ratings are really low, um, this is pretty much business as usual. When he's advocating for somebody who's not even a constituent or a resident of Jersey, um, this Dr. Melgen, and he's working both, whether it's a contract, uh, the Dominican Republic, or trying to get Medicare payments, the optics don't look good. Correct. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's actually, a, I assume that was a pun intended concern <laughs> that we're dealing with yes. as an ophthalmologist. Um, it's not the kind of thing that the public instantly jumps up on. Uh, you know, when the case gets to be more real, um, if people perceive that it's starting to cost the state, you know, in terms of energy on the part of the senator, I think that can, you know, that can change. There's a lot for people to be upset about. They're picking and choosing. Well, I got to tell you, if, you if, if people haven't read it already and you want to have uh, a, a good laugh and a good read, um, Alfred's piece, When Christy Plays Tommy DeVito, Nobody Laughs uh, from this week, uh, very good stuff. Hey, um, as always, Alfred, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, and I'll bring in our good fellows. Our panel comes in to discuss all things Jersey straight ahead. And then... The rift between the police and their communities growing even wider in the wake of that horrible fatal shooting by a cop in South Carolina captured by a passerby. We'll discuss why this problem is just so hard to fix.